Most associations, you know, are made up of competitors, but the Associated Credit Bureaus was made up of individuals who freely shared information. Then they whispered to me on that visit that they were actually starting to think about using computers in the future. Customer relations were changing, the relationships with your vendors were changing. It was just an absolutely dynamic time to be in the industry. There was no question the industry understood that like it or not, they were going to get federal legislation. The societal benefits that come from the kind of information that we maintain in our members' databases uh, are, are critical to every part of our walk of life. We are told we must learn to appreciate our past before we can fully understand the future. Today's CDIA members truly empower consumers and are key to the success of our nation's economy. Credit reporting helps sell 17 million cars and trucks every year. 73% of U.S. households have access to unsecured lines of credit. Seven out of 10 Americans own their own home. CDIA's members are the leading companies in their respective industries. These companies protect and empower consumers. They enable billions of transactions to be completed every year. But it wasn't always this way. How did this grand experiment in trust and responsibility begin? And why? Consumer credit was born as a result of America's agrarian economy in the late 19th century. Early retailers realized that farm families needed access to products year-round, not just when crops delivered a cash harvest in the fall. America at the turn of the century was seeing the shift of the population from the country to the city. Consumers wanted and needed access to credit to fulfill their goal of realizing the American dream. Someone had to assist creditors and consumers so that credit transactions could become a reality. On February 24, 1906, four gentlemen met in Rochester, New York. They recognized that an organization was needed to represent the companies that were developing a more structured approach to organizing consumer payment data. William H. Burr became the first president of the National Association of Retail Credit Agencies. The stated purposes of the association were to make the business of credit reporting more efficient and profitable. At the first annual convention held later that year, the topic that generated the most discussion was how bureaus could exchange consumer information with other members. Thus was born what would later become the inter-bureau coupon system of the association. The formation of the association paralleled an increasing reliance on credit among retailers. In 1910, only 10% of all department store purchases were credit transactions. They had doubled by 1920. Now the credit grantor was more sophisticated in his credit lending operation. They wanted to know the past payment history of that consumer. But the crash of the stock market in 1929 saw the onset of the Great Depression, and the growth of credit reporting slowed just like the rest of the economy. Reaching out in these troubled times for survival, the 267 members of the association became a division of the National Retail Credit Association, a group of retail credit executives. This was a recognition that credit bureaus were dominated by retail firms, and many were merchant-owned. Well, many bureaus, in fact, I'd say most bureaus, started either as a, an additional service of the Merchants uh, Association in that community or the Chamber of Commerce or in some cases they were simply member-owned organizations that grew from infancy and uh, became full-blown uh, credit bureaus. In 1934, the association was spun off from NRCA and became the National Consumer Credit Reporting Corporation. By this time, there were over 1,200 credit bureau and 600 collection agency members. The move marked the beginning of the end of credit bureaus being predominantly local retail information providers. Additional lenders began to understand the vital role played by credit bureaus. 
A survey by the Department of Commerce showed that the losses of retail firms not using credit bureau data was eight times worse than those who did. On July 28, 1937, the association once again changed its name to Associated Credit Bureaus of America. Now headquartered in St. Louis, the charter read that the association was created for educational work among its members for the improvement of credit reporting. It was very important, since most of our members were quite small, to uh, develop educational training materials for uh, credit reporters, for sales personnel, for collectors, for supervisors, for management. We had a very comprehensive program with management institutes and uh, seminars that were held around the country. The onset of World War II once again brought the consumer credit market to a virtual halt. To help the war cause, Regulation W was implemented by the government to reduce debt and prevent inflation. The issue of survival once again came into play, not only for our country, but for the credit bureaus as well. By 1942, four credit bureaus a week were being shuttered. To survive, many ACB of A members turned to issuing personnel reports, which were required for those employees working in the war industries. Following the war, the consumer credit industry once again sprang to life. The lifting of wartime restrictions and the growing post-war demand for goods and services, now unleashed by GIs returning to civilian life, released a pent-up buying demand. The results were dramatic. In 1946, two million dollars worth of televisions were sold. Four years later, that number jumped to two billion dollars. In fact, of the $10 billion in electrical appliances sold in 1956, more than one-third involved merchandise that was new to the market that decade. Credit was reshaping the economy and offering consumers a lifestyle that had taken their parents decades to achieve. And if you just think about the 50s and the 60s, you see for the first time uh, innovative financial services products being offered in the marketplace that really were never offered before. The first credit cards were being introduced by local merchants and revolving credit enhanced the lifestyle of consumers looking to improve their way of life. That idea wasn't even possible without the underwriting of data, if you will, that came from the credit reporting system uh, that we represented. Even in the 1960s, data management required an immense amount of labor. CDIA's members were thought leaders in bringing about the era of automation. The term automation had several shades of meaning in the industry. Initially, it just meant taking these pieces of paper and finding a, a better way of shuffling the paper. We entered into a four-part agreement. The association, the, our member in Houston, Dallas, and IBM to develop the software to automate a metropolitan credit bureau. And I'd only been on the job about 90 to 120 days when I woke up one morning to find out that uh, automation was uh, coming into Toledo, Ohio from the Detroit area. You can't underestimate the impact, the traumatic impact, that going from the safe, manual, I can touch it, feel it, read it, file, to saying, okay, I'm gonna trust a box to send it back out to me and not lose it. In 1964, the ACB of A offices moved to Houston. There were now over 3,100 members. It was also the year that the first uniform reporting standards, called Credit Scope, were adopted for the reporting of credit payments by lenders. These progressive standards continue today with the use of the Metro 2 format that provides more than 4 billion updates of information monthly. Like so many industries during this period, Credit reporting soon became a target for government regulation and the media. 